Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So I was sitting there the other week thinking some some different thoughts with respect to the cryptocurrency market and some upcoming strategies. And was uh, this was uh, after an appearance I made on the DGen Roundtable stream on a Wednesday night. I think it was probably a bit too much vodka consumed that evening. But uh, anyway, so I was hanging out with some of these fine folks and just started spitballing and talking about, hey, what are some of the different things we think potentially are coming for future aspects of the market and what are some of the things we can do better this cycle so to that end i decided to reach out to some of those fine folks and friends to talk a little bit today about some of the upcoming market predictions some moon math maybe some signs of slowing down and some exit timing type stuff because certainly i could have done things a little bit better in the end of 21 and 22 so to that end, I reached out to these friends. And one of the things I really appreciate about, appreciate about today's guest is they all believe and emphasize personal development and acquiring knowledge and skills and building community and connections. They've all shown a desire to figure things out and develop, build, and cultivate opportunities and share with those around them. So to that end, let me bring on my first special guest today. Uh, this gentleman here, he and I have spoken a number of times about market psychology, had a few late night drinks after some streams and the like, uh, taking a look at things like uh, other tokens and dominance, trying to gaze into the abyss of future alternate indicators. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the ascending man himself, Nate from the DGen Roundtable. Nate, how you doing today, man? Uh, doing good, doing good. I, uh, yeah, I just got off of work because apparently we have to work a Saturday. Yay. But <laughs> hey, I am here and I was able to make it. So yeah, excited for this. We got a lot of really good things to talk about today. So let's get it. Well, looking forward to it. Uh, second gentleman here, we had a great talk uh, some weeks back in a chandelier bar. I think that was the Cosmo uh, talking about some potential upcoming crazy price action. We watched some folks make and lose fortunes at the craps table and uh, had a real interesting conversation about things like settlement layers, volumes, currencies, monies, L1, L2, L3, L0 use cases over one of the biggest pancakes I have ever seen. Ladies and gentlemen, Zenith from the DGen Roundtable. Z, what's going on, brother? Good to see you, my man. Yeah, it's been a hot minute since we were hanging out in Vegas, swapping ideas while you were feeling great and I was hungover at <laughs> breakfast. But it, it, nonetheless, it's always good to be with you and talk about everything for the folks that don't know at home. Uh, Nate and I are both from DGen Roundtable. Uh, Nate is one of our more meme coin and risk, uh, less risk averse people. And I am sort of the more white collar suit and tie aspect of it. So I try to tie in as much traditional finance and uh, economic stuff as possible. So that is what Twinkie was alluding to earlier. Either way, glad to be here. And we got one more guy coming up and he is the big boy. And we are super happy to be hanging out again. Uh, yeah, he is definitely way taller than he looks on camera. So that's for damn sure. I was uh, quite surprised by that. <laughs> so uh, a homie here has got a very deceptive camera angle. Uh, we also had I had the opportunity to watch our next individual speak about some, let's say, residual and passive income opportunities in the Richard Hart ecosystem. He was spitballing a little bit, too, about some price projection. He is a global brand ambassador of one of the very coolest educational tools I've seen for TA on chain analysis. Uh, in liquidity provisioning. Uh, we also had a really great chat later in the evening about weaponized autism, video games, and puzzles. So to that end, I give you Axis. Axis, what's going on, brother? Hey, man. I'm doing well, man. There's a bunch of cool stuff going on in the space. What can I say? I, I've been pleasantly surprised by the reveal of the 414 dev recently. Axis hit a new, a new all-time high of $50,000 per unit um what else is going on in the space um johnny Sachs is getting into fights with sami over calm and hex and, and whether or not it's bearish or bullish to pay people to stake <laughs> uh what else is going on i don't know but it's been a fun uh couple weeks here coming home from the vegas trip so pleasure meeting you there all all two of you were there um yeah it was a good event Good show up. It was it was probably the most people that's come to a Pulse Chain tour event in a while. So it was very very refreshing. A lot of new faces, and uh, uh, you know the the table feels cleared and and ready to set up for the next major leg in the in the Pulse Chain ecosystem. So I'm here to share my knowledge, understanding, maybe share some secret alpha, but we'll see where we land on some of this stuff. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. All right. So before we get to the main topic of the day. Uh, I've got a few minor topics just to warm us up. So first one here, this one caught my attention the other day. And 
let me quickly share this one out. So relative to the topic here is, this one made me laugh. Uh, in this particular case, Call of Duty cheaters allegedly lose their Bitcoin as hackers target gamers with malware. So, okay, unfortunately, some of these individuals appear to uh, have lost some funds in that particular arena. However, I think there may be a little bit of a moral lesson here and also an underlying info security lesson. So in this particular case, everyone knows Call of Duty, huge franchise, uh, huge gaming element. Uh, this malware has impacted hundreds of thousands of players around the world and the numbers are still growing and if you skim through the article here the short version of it is a bunch of uh, or a group of cyber criminals uh released some malware tied to some cheat integration on this folks installed it turns out there's an aspect of overlap with gamers and cryptocurrency enthusiasts and in this particular case people are reporting that their bitcoin wallet in this case the electrum wallets were being drained so initial thoughts on this one. This is absolutely wild, dude. The fact, I mean, so number one, like, why are you trying to cheat? You know, I mean, if you're really not that skilled, I mean, come on, dude. There's There are some fun things you can do, yes, but you you know for a fact that these guys were doing this because the, it was a competitive deal. But yeah, that's that's kind of wild, you know. And when they when they get these cheats too, because I used to do Call of Duty all the time. When they get them, it, it's always a very sketchy uh, website with some dev who just created something. They're like, yeah, yeah it's right here. Go, go click this. So I don't know why these people thought it was a good idea in the first place. <laughs> the irony so of <clears throat> somebody who cheats gets taken from. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things like there's no honor among thieves, right? All right. It's so it's if you look into this article in particular, based on what I picked up, it seems like this was actually a hack created by an oppositional party to another party that also creates cheats, and they wanted to try and target some of those folks as well. And understanding the attack vector that they went on with this one might demystify what's going on here. It's not just like, you magically were playing Call of Duty, someone accused you of cheating, and next thing you know, your Bitcoin was forcibly revoked from you. What this sounds like it was is that this company created third-party software, which if you tried to download on your computer, chances are Windows Defender would look at you and say, are you high? Uh, and then anyways, you click the button, says, yes, I am high, please download. And then at that point, what it does is it sounds like it actually tried to log your login info for whatever uh, whatever wallet you were using. So this is not actually like kind of attacking the encryption what it's doing is effectively creating a key logger so it's just waiting for you to access your funds it's tracking all your keystrokes and all your movements so that way it can identify okay he accessed this program this info this uh, information was input cool now we have it thank you for the login to your wallet so blx had a great point here why would you install third-party software on the same computer you trade crypto ding 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 Absolutely. Right. And, and I know that's something some of uh, my mentors have stressed over the years is keep your stuff separate, OPSEC, InfoSec and the like. And OK, there is a little bit, I think, of a karmic satisfaction in, in seeing the cheaters get taken for a ride on this one. But uh, to me, this also highlights the ongoing increase of crypto adoption. And as people go through this, it's it's something I think a lot of normies aren't necessarily going to think of or people who are maybe newer to the space as they initially dip their toes into self custody elements of this. They may not necessarily have thought this all the way through and the see the value in keeping this stuff separate. All right. Appreciate Real everyone. Quick, and, yeah, go just ahead. A, so black label expat has a really good point on this one. This question to a lot of people might sound a bit foreign, which is why. He's asking, I don't know why someone would install third-party software on the same computer you trade crypto. That's like saying, I only have one computer. Why would I not use it for everything? To the people that don't know or don't like have a full vision or at least a base-level understanding of like cybersecurity and counter-security measures, this is one of those things where it's like, it is actually probably worthwhile to sort of diversify your defenses. If you want to learn more about this topic, check out Securing Wallets by Stephen Bates. We had him on the dgen roundtable at one point he's a cybersecurity expert and the book really gives you an intro level perspective onto understanding cybersecurity because it's different than normal security normal security is i have the one house i live in i just put a ring doorbell on uh on my doorbell maybe a window alarm that's on ground level or something and that's about it but this one is like 
unless you are actually a person that's working in the software development and networking field, you're not going to have a full understanding. And unless you actually understand the attack vectors, you're kind of just throwing spaghetti at the walls. So get a little bit educated, understand how people attack you. Uh, fun fact, it's primarily just people on Twitter claiming to be a Nigerian prince and asking for your seed words, which uh, as uh, Walrus likes to say, uh, your seed words are a thing between you and God and no one else. So that's really the attack vector. It's a lot of low IQ, low level stuff. The chances of your MetaMask actually getting hacked by a, a foreign malicious party is super, super low. It's still very much low IQ attacks that are ground level, kind of like con artist type stuff. And this is somewhat in that same vein which is that it's not actually breaking encryption. What it is, is it's breaking you. You are the weak link in this scenario, and you are choosing to download the thing that is malicious, even though you think it's something else. So that's why they say, like, if you do keep crypto on a separate computer, that's a great wall of defense. If you keep your crypto diversified, whether it's like a hot wallet, a centralized exchange, a cold wallet, that's also another line of defense. Understand that each of these things has costs, benefits, pros, and cons, but at the same time, if we're investing in crypto, it might be worthwhile investing in your defense, so... And as far as I'm understanding what ended up happening, <laughs> rant over, um, as far as I'm understanding it, basically what's happening then is it's just simply it's a, it's a program that gets on the computer, looks at where you go for, you know, your crypto and then watches what you've logged for the actual password itself, not actually the seed phrase, right? I'd have to go back and take a look at that. So I remember, was it Phantom Wallet and MetaMask for a period of time? This was, what, maybe two, three years ago? I had a scenario where aspects of the seed phrase were being stored locally or in memory, and people were getting scraped on those and having those picked up. Of course, the obvious stuff is don't take a photo of it, don't save it in a Word doc, yeah. don't back it up to the cloud, don't email it to yourself. But uh, again, for some of the newer folks coming into this space, they may get caught with their pants down on that one. Yeah, All right, my yeah. question then would be, do we have, so would a different browser then count? Because like with me, I got several different browsers with several different uh, wallets. So no, no because they're keys, they're key logging anything that you type into your computer. So, so that's if everything. you, if you click a button and you type something in, they have a full record of that. Hmm. And then they could cross corroborate the if they knew <clears throat> that you touched your MetaMask and you made a transaction, they could go look at if they knew anything about any of your addresses, that'd be easier to corroborate when you typed in the words. So, because you could get the timestamps on the from the blockchain. But anyway, the yeah, it's it it's a total compromise because you opened up to, to the to the thieves. So, yeah, the key loggers are the worst because it copies it. It's recording everything you type. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to move us right along into our second topic. Thanks, gents, for the uh, assessment on that one and some collective agreement in best practices. So second on deck, I think it's no surprise. Uh, I'm a bit of fan of ongoing emerging technology and evolutions in that space. So to that end, new voice engine from OpenAI only needs 15 seconds to clone your speech. So I was recently talking about some of the stuff from ARK Invest Research, and their argument is uh, particularly AI and neural networks are going to serve as a major catalyst for emerging and converging technologies. Uh, they've actually gotten some interesting uh, uh, reviews and assessments of things like, well, reusable rock neural networks will improve our ability to drive reusable rockets and battery technology. So eventually you'll have solar, battery backup, distributed nodes, for things like validators and chains and the like, thus making any chain potentially far more secure. So imagine, you know, fast forward a couple of years, we've got two to three years, two to five years, reusable rockets driven into space by AI, dropping the solar arrays with battery backups and additional validator nodes for Pulse Chain, for Bitcoin, for whichever chain it ends up being in the future uh, on that front. But going back to our prior topic uh, related to aspects of AI and voice cloning. In this case, they say they only need 15 seconds. It's in closed testing. They acknowledge the potential for abuse. What was interesting to me is they're stating, uh, stating here that the voice intonation and other distinctly patterns based on a small sample of audio can recreate and create emotive and realistic voices. So pretty soon, look, we, I think some of us have seen Sora, which is their video production tool from OpenAI and like, uh, we're getting to the point or we have transcended the point where you can believe everything you see on screen and everything you hear. Is that the real Z? Does Axis really sound like that? Or is this really just some clever modulation and obscuring technology? So as far as, let's say, acknowledging other aspects of emerging tech and like any initial reactions and thoughts to things like 
technology like this where, you know, maybe I want to phone it in. I don't want to shave today. I don't want to get up. I don't want to be on camera. Let me throw a few switches and have my virtual representation handle everything while I maybe or maybe not narrate into a mic. So mm -hmm. early thoughts and reactions. Raul Paul, actually, he he's built himself an AI that is himself and he's able to like talk to himself that way and what he wants to do with it uh, for his group or whatever is have uh, people pay to go talk to his AI self who basically thinks and talks the same way that he does. I, I think it's interesting. Hmm. I, mean, I suppose I you could also mean... have this thing analyze thousands and thousands of hours of video of you and then get even more accurate. It's interesting. I, I was thinking of it more from the attack vector of people using your likeness to accomplish their own malicious goals which is a concern. Um, but outside of that, yeah, I, that's cool to think of that, that you could basically have yourself available if, you know, for eternity to people. That's pretty interesting. Axis, I think I'm with you on this one, is that it seems like it definitely could be an attack vector. And it's one of these things we're going to have to worry about going into the future, which is what is real, what is not real, what is fabricated and what is not. Although on a slightly different tangent, one of the things I've seen with all this AI stuff is that it seems like we're almost at the point where you can legitimately use entirely AI powered tools to analyze like an entertainment space like YouTube or the crypto sphere and then have AI look at what's popular, write a script, do voice acting, make video to go with it, stitch it all together. And then effectively, all you need is maybe someone to publish it unless you can find a way to automate that. And at that point, you have this weird loop where it's like it is AI making content for what AI believes the other AI will like. So it's this weird thing where it's like you might actually start disconnecting human input on this one. And instead of improving quality inside the, the education and entertainment space, it might actually start going downhill because the AI could like latch on to something real funky. Like, I don't know, for some reason, it doesn't understand that we keep using sarcasm talking about Gary Gensler. And then uh, <laughs> what, what was the coin that he used to promote at MIT? Algorand. Yeah, yeah, and then the AI just starts promoting Algorand for some reason because it doesn't <laughs> understand that we don't like Gary. And we were like, oh, yeah, they keep talking about this guy. They must like him a lot. <laughs> well, actually, I got something even scarier. So AIs, when they start talking to each other, right, they will actually create uh, phantom realities of their own conclusions about what life actually is. And so, therefore, they start acting <laughs> upon things based on that uh, that that phantom world that they have created. So if you start getting enough of these AIs just doing things, um, you know, on the, uh, on the Internet, and then they'll eventually come back around to being like, to literally just making up their own stuff at this point. And that's then the scariest thing, though, getting back to the voice, uh, the voiceovers. Right. The scariest thing that I've been looking at uh, kind of fearful of is the the elections. So when are when are they going to start like trying to attack each other? You know, all the different. Uh, the different sides when they start attacking each other using completely fake AI generated things, but people will believe it because they don't quite understand this yet. There's a lot of people who are not on the, on the spear tip of technology like we are, right? There's going to, you're literally going to have your own grandma watching something on TV, like a commercial on TV and be like, Oh my gosh, did he really say that? No, no, he did not. But they won't know the difference. And it's actually kind of scary. I mean, you've seen those, uh, the Michael Saylor commercial, send me one Bitcoin, I'll send you a two. Mm -hmm. They yeah. actually have those commercials on YouTube right now. And it's decently convincing. He's the best Nigerian prince there ever was. <laughs> oh, we're in for a fun time. Hopefully uh, the boomers don't live forever so that less <laughs> of them get scammed. And that money actually gets passed on to their heirs. I know I'm being kind of facetious, but no, that's kind of where we're at. Is like most folks are, you know, I shouldn't say most of them. I actually have a lot of people between the ages of 30, and I and I have to correct myself from a stream the other day. I said, you know, that the the future of crypto is like the 20s and 30s year old crowd right now. But actually, a lot of my members, <clears throat> a lot of people starting to catch on to the the crypto movement. They're older. They're like in their 40s, 50s, 60s, even. And they've even some of them came to Vegas. So it, it's actually it crypto kind of speaks to every generation in in a lot of ways, which is kind of an exciting prospect. Um, 
on its own. But to the original point, so much money is getting extracted from the older, you know, middle class, I guess you could say, um, from scammers. Like it's a, it's a real issue. This just gives them an extra tool in the toolbox with a lot of this stuff to manipulate and control. I mean, imagine scammers, you basically reverse engineering like a, a family's Facebook friend group and trying to accumulate as much audio, video, pictures that they could of connected parties and then using that to generate fake phone calls to get people to give up their information or something. Like, it could get... It's a, probably been there. And then to take it a step further and zoom out even with a wider lens, there's enough discussion and a reason to believe that this has already been going on from three-letter agencies or high levels of government on the American population as a psyop in, in its own ways for 14, 15 years already. Um, like when I forget the name of the, there was some act that got passed that allowed government to basically do psyops on its own population. And I mean, all you need to do is look at the education system or the food system. Uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the food, the, uh, food supply chain to see how messed up it is here in America. Um, and, uh, Ultimately, I don't know what the end goal is. I think you just got to listen to smart people like these guys, get educated. I know it's tough. Like people around me that are in crypto for even four and five years that are over the age of 40, 50, so in 60 in some cases, like recently have been getting hacked. I know scams are at all time highs. Not to take this in that direction completely, but it is something to be concerned about. You got to think about every single, you know, this kind of ties back into both AI and to the original discussion point of security. Um, and, and you just have to be really, really smart to be your own fucking bank. And if you're not, for those people, we they need a solution. So that seems to me like really low hanging fruit for smart guys like us to come in and give them a solution that's somehow still allows them to custody their own stuff, but in like a like, uh, a ner you know, like, you know, people talk about nerf in the world. We need to be able to nerf, be your own bank so that people can't sh shoot themselves in the foot, but they can still custody their own stuff somehow. And I don't know what that looks like, but solving a lot of these problems probably isn't as hard as it seems. It just takes some effort. Somebody has to start a company, build the right software, work through the user experience. Crypto's user experience is horrible. Um, and then just, you know, a lot of these folks that would get duped by a lot of this stuff, they just don't have the proper upbringing or education on how to even just use a, a computer, like just how to use an operating system. Like so many people, you know, were born into this world before computers even existed. And unlike us who like were using video games and computers and cell phones from the time they were invented, like they didn't have that same experience of like growing up with the technology so for them, they don't even know, you know, best case, best best ways to um, to prosper. You don't even know like simple things like control alt delete or like, you know, refresh the page or like if, if something looks wonky. Like here's one: my MetaMask spits out a different dollar value on Pulse Chain because the price feed's wrong. There's another layer of complexity that people are like, well, I thought I had five hundred dollars, but it's only saying I have one hundred and fifty dollars of Pulse. It's like MetaMask, get your shit together. You know, like this is a real chain. You know. It do no price feed or fix, put the right price feed on there. Don't give us some half-ass, you know, thing. And this is all growing pains, guys. But you're, you're not going to know that stuff unless you're dealing with the technology every day. And so education is so important in this to help people understand this stuff and bridge that gap and, and let them walk across the bridge safely, I guess. Well, I, I want to point out... Go for it, Nate. It, this is just real quick. I want to point out how the internet kind of started. And I kind of feel like we're in the same spot here because when you when when the World Wide Web came out and you were able to start browsing, it was an absolute nightmare to have to do anything. It was basically only text. And then you had to actually type out the location of the website you wanted to go to. There was no search or anything. Uh, so that I mean, that right there is hard enough. Then all of a sudden they come out with the, the searches and it's like, OK, well, you could use some keywords and. Uh, find what you're looking for but 
there really again there really wasn't much there everything was very flat um there wasn't like hyperlinks or anything going on and then from there it evolved into you can have hyperlinks google came out things started looking more more clean right um more act it's just user friendly so that's all i wanted to add on i think that's kind of where we're at though with crypto is things are starting to become more friendly and i you know what i'll point out pulse chain actually does this with the uh every single um site that you go to that has their their specific tokens or whatever you simply click that little token and it automatically adds it to your metamask when i go to other chains they don't have that and it's really annoying because then i have to go back in find the coin find the address for it right the contract address uh, um highlight it and then go and put it into whatever it is i'm trying to swap on but you know you could just add it to metamask on pulse chain just by clicking Click the little uh, thumbnail. Sounds good. So appreciate good. everyone weighing in on the uh, preliminary topics today. So we're going to get into some future forecasting, taking a look at the uh, abyss or crystal ball, depending on the scenario here, get into some rampantly uh, uh, unprofessional speculation here and just see where it takes us. So uh, before we go down that path, I think this was an appropriate visual indicator potentially of what we might be looking at like here in the relatively near future <laughs> i've given this some thought i know everyone here is uh giving us uh giving this some thought as we try to figure out hey what does the future hold for us in the grand Where'd scheme you of find things? that picture of me <laughs> i think we've all felt like that and continue to feel like that you know when it's like 2 a.m and you're scrolling through crypto twitter looking at charts just you know skimming through telegram groups and the like so uh to that end i'm gonna go loosely round robin here in one second i'll i'll kick us off here so one of the things i am thinking is potentially by the end of this cycle probably this cycle to next cycle i think it ends up being somewhat a coinbase world and we're all just living in it so axis you touched upon a key item there with that the user experience is in a lot of ways horrific for crypto needing to know how to bridge assets running multiple wallets multiple seed phrases multiple profiles telegram groups all sorts of research elements dex screener dex tools trading view uh different other services people may use on that front and what's pushing me in in making these statements currently is i look at things like the liquidity supply across different chains different elements and it's very fractured when you start looking at l2 it's kind of there's arbitrum and then there's literally everybody else and sure there may be different elements of optimism powering some of those different l2 chains coinbase has made massive inroads in 100 plus countries 130 180 plus countries depending on what they're doing making usdc available uh, they may have staking protocols available outside the US or outside of North America. One of the things that they've done really well is they have their app. You want to go buy the asset, you buy the asset. Now, okay, the, the giant elephant in the room is it is a custodial based relationship with them. But to the end user, if I want to potentially go buy that meme token, if it's on base, or I want to buy, take your pick of some project token, so long as it's listed on Coinbase, it's an easy app to get to. Uh, they have stated there won't, won't necessarily be a base token, then I think there's an underlying compelling argument that potentially it's going to be a Coinbase world as far as onboarding normies globally, potentially as early as end of this cycle, maybe next cycle. For the panel, anyone got any thoughts on that one? Yeah, so I like, I like your thinking process. Here's the, here's the thought that I've always gone back to, okay? how is it done how is wall wall street done now right how are you able to trade stocks the way that it used to be is that you actually had to go down to wall street you had to stand in the middle of all those people and then you had to you had a bunch of tickers and stuff that you had had to talk to other people about right okay so fast forward into modern day now what do we got we got things like robin hood you know you e-trade you just simply get on the computer and just i want to buy this there's my money right it's connected to my bank it's as simple as that so i think that's kind of the interface that we're kind of the direction we're going i do see centralized exchanges as being the normal for just about everything and i think decentralized exchanges have done a good job at at trying to be that but for self custodying yourself right but I don't think that's going to be the normal thing. 
I think most everybody is going to go the direction of like, say the ETFs, right? There's going to be somebody else who's going to be holding your funds for you. And I think that's needed because the majority of people absolutely cannot be doing the, the own your own bank type of deal. It's just, it's too much risk and there's not nearly as many people that are number one, have time to learn about it. But number two, I would say almost smart enough. Hmm. Access. So, I, yeah, I mean, I definitely worry about that, like whether or not the population can catch up and, and, and play the game that way. I I doubt that you'll ever get like, you'll, I doubt you'll ever even like approach 25% of the world's population self custodies their own cryptocurrency. I mean, I just don't have that much faith in people to keep interest in that. I know just from my own, you know, history that you know, finance was never interesting to me. Math was never interesting to me. But kicking the shit out of the Federal, uh, the fractional reserve banking system was interesting to me. So, like, being contrarian and on the edge of it and ahead of the curve, and being able to print money legally, and you know, com- you know, in my own little way, compete with the Fed was interesting enough for me to want to learn this stuff. But I know that's not going to be the case for everybody. Um, not everybody's, most people just want to live their day to day life and, uh, not think about those things. And that makes sense too. Um, I just don't think that, I think that we don't have the tech yet that kind of walks the line between self custody and, um, the right level of security. I I don't know. I think Coinbase is a good stepping stone for, for holding onto a lot of the world's uh, crypto wealth, um, in cold storage. And then they just play on somebody else's paper version of it. That makes sense. That seems like a transitionary thing until inevitably everything becomes tokenized. Um, and you're basically loading into your bank app. So my thing, my, the way I look at it is <clears throat> with cell phones in the early days, you know, getting grandma to text was hard, <laughs> but nowadays grandma sends pictures and voice messages and text and talks to their phone. And so if we got it that far, you know, grandma can go into the chase banking app or whatever, bank app and send and receive and deposit and and so i believe that in the same way it's actually not going to be that hard to bridge that gap it just needs to look familiar and then all of the blockchain stuff just needs to be on the back end so that all they're going to experience is the button deposit withdraw send receive you know what the, what we're trying to do with metamask um, but enable that into your banking uh, app so that you can go directly from checking account to an asset digital asset and back and basically uh, blur the lines between all these, this multi-chain world where there's no longer, you know, the SWIFT system or like the TradFi system and then there's crypto, more like it merges or blends into one ecosystem, like one global economy with less friction, um, which is going to change everyday life in ways that we can't see yet. That's the interesting part is like your daily life will change drastically when there's no friction between getting money in and out of crypto. And I think the regulate regulatory um, conditions is what's preventing it. I don't think it's anything but that. I think basically if regulation was, everyone was all in on crypto, CBDCs, you know, exotic cryptos, you know, blue chip cryptos. If we could just all agree that this is the future and move in that direction, which will happen eventually, you're going to get this, this effect where, all these 97% of the of web de, web 2 developers are going to capitulate into web 3 and start developing on web 3 and that's just going to become a major piece of the web and the only thing standing in its way in my opinion is regulation even more so than 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 modern man's ignorance to adopt the technology i think that i think it's actually the fear of you know bitcoin's going to get banned or you know whatever these old narratives were i think that's kind of what stands in the way more than anything Z, thoughts on that one? Yeah, so when it comes to <clears throat> when it comes to where we stand in the crypto space, there's no doubt that we are those people that enjoy driving the manual car because we believe that we can get more benefit out of driving the manual or shooting the camera in manual mode. We're absolutely playing on hard mode to try to receive hard mode benefits. Yep. So there's kind of two sides to this question for me, one of which is, are people going to go to ease of access or are they going to go to competitive advantage because this is a competitive market? 
what I mean by that is, yes, you can try to go for mass adoption through ease of access. That's where you see things like Robinhood, Coinbase, all the stuff, all the non-custodial wallets or sort of things. And there's absolutely appeal to the masses. However, at the same time, that's not where the vast majority of the wealth or even the financial institutions lie. You will absolutely, in my opinion, we will absolutely see the this the advanced money and the smart money and the big money, traditional money, so to speak, they're going to be the ones that are more willing to play on hard mode because they think that they can squeak out that like 0.1 competitive advantage uh, against the average folks. Meanwhile, the average person is probably just going to be happy to have their slice of the pie, no matter how infinitesimally small it is. As long as you are a part of the pie, you will reap the rewards. However, at the same time, understand that on the short time horizons, it's absolutely player versus player when the market in market forces like that which is that the amount of money in the market is only the amount of money that has been put into the market. So if you are trying to day trade or do something even more degenerate than that, like something with automated trading, then yeah, that's where you're going to, you're going to see those people playing on hard mode, AKA doing all the DeFi self self custody, that kind of stuff. It's, it's like, yes, you can get mass adoption. However, understand that kind of at the end of the day, this is still power games and people are going to be fighting for for power and especially playing and trying to swing swing around the weight that they possess so yeah mass adoption is good however you guys all hit excellent points that we've all been talking about and trying to wrap our brains around and find a solution for for the long time which is that we're at the crossroads of is this an ease of access issue for getting people onboarded or is this a literacy problem aka we just need people to learn how to text grandma better or whatever so i don't think anyone has a single solution right now but that's when the solution does come out. I think that's where we're going to get that next step forward. Well, the thing that I've been kind of looking at is, and this is what happens when I onboard someone in, into crypto. I try and make it as simple as possible and have them click the least amount of buttons as possible. So if I say something like, hey, I want you to think about this as a retirement account, okay? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to go make an account on crypto.com. And then out of your paycheck, you're going to you're going to toss in like ten dollars into Ethereum every single paycheck. And you're just going to keep doing that. You don't look at the price. You don't look at anything else. Just do that. Just hold it there. Now, a lot of people will sit there and say, oh, but, you know, self-custody, that's not a good thing to tell people. But this, this is where crypto bros need to need to start learning themselves, because as you say, Z, we're, we're on hard mode, right? Trying to get better benefits. Well, m the majority of people are not going to be playing on hard mode. Instead, they want the easy mode. And so you can't sit there and say, tell other people, just the normies, hey, you need to do this and do this and do this and get self-custody and be your own bank and blah, 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 blah. You can't do that. You, it, This is where you would say, hey, it's a good thing to be sitting on a centralized exchange. All you need to do is, you know, three steps. Done. That's how you get people into it. Um, I mean, when you're thinking about like with us, sure, we're gonna go, we're gonna go <laughs> do the hard mode of stuff, right? But that's when we become the teachers, and we need we need to adjust the difficulty level based on who it is we're teaching. Any thoughts on that? I think we're gonna get. I think we're gonna get it all. I think it's just gonna take a little bit longer. <clears throat> Agreed. I think. Uh, yeah, you're, you're never, it reminds me of gaming. So like, that's my sector I came from where mm. there's like that hardcore audience, you know, for, you know, that is, it's going to come back every single time there's a new console launch is going to be standing in line at 5am waiting for Walmart to open to buy it, right? Or the iPhone or whatever. So that's going to be who's going to like get, that's who's gotten Bitcoin from zero to 70, whatever thousand dollars, those guys. Um, and, and if, if there's enough of those guys that do well enough, people start to turn their head. We're already at that stage. You know, Coinbase is a great solution, I think, in a lot of ways. And now that, that, that BlackRock and other big par uh, interested parties have their hooks in it, that's going to be where most people are going to go to transact for the first time. I know I made my first Bitcoin buy on Coinbase. So that's always a good starting place. And I guess maybe that's that's the way to look at this is it's like you're going to have like level one, level two, level three, and people are going to evolve over over the cycles so you know it always takes people two or three cycles to really figure out crypto um and, and then uh cycle one is always uh starting with coinbase and that's just i think that's can be 
you know, you can expect that more longer term. And then in terms of maybe it's good to make the distinction between institutional adoption and retail adoption um, in the sense that, you know, a lot of the institutional money is going to come in and that stuff's going to get, that's going to bring in the dollar liquidity that crypto seeks and it needs to, 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 to live off of. But those coins are just going to get locked in a cold storage somewhere, either under Coinbase's custody or their own, and it'll be different for each institution. And that's so basically, there's the liquidity um, element to this, and then there's like the the market element to this, which is like everyday people. That most of that is, you know, they may, they may not be bringing in the economic energy, but they're going to bring in the users, right? And so they're going to, yeah, they, I agree that they're going to come in through really regular centralized exchanges to start, and then. Like what the there's they're already going through different efforts to try to get people to think more broadly about crypto and to move their coins into their own custody. But the problem with some of this is again comes back to people make mistakes and then they always look for someone to blame. So like in the case of someone who gets scanned by sending their Coinbase information to the wrong people, like well that's not really Coinbase's fault, but they'll still try to go after Coinbase because they think it's Coinbase's fault because they don't understand who's in control in all those situations and people are quick to blame the other person and never themselves so i think there's a lot of you know the uh coinbase like law side of their ledger that says all their liabilities is probably pretty deep because of people that lose money on their own doing and so you got to think we got to work through all that dumb money too and all that all those problems because that becomes a huge expense or a black hole on the balance sheet of someone like coinbase or, or another exchange um, but just luckily enough the our, our cryptocurrencies go up so much faster than other things. It gives them extra collateral to use to backstop a lot of the fallout from people making mistakes early on in the adoption of the industry. See, with that being said, though, too, you bring up a you bring up a good point here, where it's like because people are gonna, and especially Yabs here talking about the one click and then lose it all type of deal. The issue that a lot of people end up running into with crypto being a scam and all that is that people do lose their money and it's usually their own fault. And so this then, yeah, they're going to complain. So I think what they're going to end up doing is trying to completely ban DeFi in general just because of that. Right. I'm not quite sure how it is that we're going to be able to to fight this because I know it's coming. But other other than just continuing to do it and ignoring the the rules, basically, or the laws that they're going to try and come out with, I really, when it happens, I'm not quite sure how we're going to be fighting that. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I don't think that they can ban it. They can only try to take, let's use cash as an example. They can, All they've done is they've minimized the amount of physical cash in the world down to like less than 3%. So you can't get rid of cash, but you can get it near zero. Um, by just inflating the digital side of the balance sheet. So is that kind of the world that we run into where they just try to um, focalize a lot of the economic energy into the blue chips that they own a lot of? And when I'm saying they, I'm talking about the powers that be. Like, let's say all of the world's wealth gets stored in Bitcoin because your Black Rocks, your Fidelities, and eventually like your Vanguards own all of it. So they have complete control of the ecosystem and the global pricing and, and everything. Is that not a case where they just try to like siphon, they basically act like a sponge where they try to get all the value to suck back into Bitcoin and then there's no one there to dump, you know, or is it going to be just natural that that big companies either way can't control themselves either because they're all for profit and it's literally just going to like you, you just won't be able to stop it and money will always bleed back into the altcoins because I don't ever foresee a future where that where there's an actual hard ban on DeFi because it's just code that you run on your own. Um, and you're really crossing a lot of lines. And this is the big point with what Richard's going after. If, in, 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 if Coinbase and Richard and, and some of these other people are successful at getting proper judgment on some of these cases, it's going to set precedent for more DeFi and more um, uh, a more open and fair playing field for the, that whole movement. And, and I don't think it's going to go the other way. I think it's actually going to be more accepted in DeFi, but just with the under the conditions that it's your stuff. If you, if you screw up, it's on you. And there's, there'd be no recourse for you screwing up. You know, I, there's already so many probably stories of people that have completely like lost 
everything in crypto because it's so easy to do. But that's not an excuse to take people's rights away from them. One last nugget for the audience to chew on before we pass it over to Twinkie, like I promised and just broke earlier. But the most, the current most authoritarian regime on the planet, the Chinese Communist Party, tried to ban Bitcoin. They effectively did, but they even walked that back. I mean, it seems like a bit of a telltale sign for where the world is going. So even if those people recognize the power of what this is, it kind of speaks volumes to whether or not the rest of the world is going to take actions along the same lines. Yeah, so uh, on that front, with respect to DeFi, I don't, I don't disagree with the panel's assessment here. Uh, I agree. You know, certainly, there was a, a great comment here by Hex Monkey with respect to us needing some DeFi lobbyists on this front. So, as far as case law rules and regs, I agree with everything stated. What I am seeing the early indicators being at this point in time is. Okay, we can't necessarily ban crypto. There might be enough case law or lack of clarity with respect to regulations that certain things are going to be left as they are today. What we saw in some of that recent European legislation is that they are banning anonymity when it comes to transactions. So, hey, we might not be able to ban your DeFi moves, but we're going to force you to tell everything up front. So that's where I see the early phases of some of those encroachments and attacks. So... Thanks to the panel for their commentary on that one. I'm going to roll us into a, a fun topic. Let's get into some moon math, prognostication, speculation, and, and let's just get let's get a little uh, a little wild out on this one. So I've had the opportunity to swap some messages and have some conversations with folks over the last few weeks on this. Uh, basically, it started one night. I was up late with Boogie talking about some pulse chain movement, and you know, what if you know, wouldn't it be great if I hit this number? And then it got into a conversation of, well, what did you know, what did Hex do? Where's Pulse at? And then just start looking at some corollary. So I look forward to picking the brains of today's panel and potentially poking some holes in these theories or coming up with, uh, hey, maybe somebody's got an even crazier number that they can somewhat justify on it. Or they sit there and go, uh, yeah, your, your number's stupid, no way in hell. Or actually, this isn't as crazy as it sounds. So uh, I'm calling for a potential, I see a path to a 33 cent pulse on this one. And I'll say I see a path on this one. And if you look at some of the bottoms of the charts, you just like four zeros and 3385. I know some of those early wicks, depending on you're looking uh, on the record you're looking at, it's like four zeros and a 25 something or other. Okay, conversationally, it's basically a 10,000 X is kind of what I'm arguing it is. I see a path to it. It's possible. That does not necessarily mean it's probable. And so uh, shout out to Lead Lag Report on Twitter. Uh, hopefully I say the gentleman's name correctly. It's Michael Gayed. He's got a great quote that is always stuck in my brain. It is conditions dictate probabilities and probabilities dictate outcomes. So with that in mind, let me walk you through some of my moon math on this front. All right. So working through this, what I took a look at was the overall hex chart to getting into a range of its all-time high. For conversation's sake, I just said, hey, it's about 34 odd days. So I looked at some of the other charts that were out there and some of the other data sets. Shout out to hexstats.today. And I was able to pull down a CSV of some of their data sets uh, on this one. So crunching through it, I took a look at ballpark all-time high according to this data set. Just again, kind of getting on the dance floor on this. And... The justification I used was, if we skim over here, I took a look at roughly speaking total holders circa that time frame, and you can see we're sitting at around 350,000 odd holders. So I'm going to somewhat misappropriate Metcalf's law on aspects of this. If it's a, what the value of a network is users squared, and that doesn't actually hold indefinitely, it tends to look a little bit more like an S curve in a number of situations. But hey, we're having a little fun today. Average number of pulse chain wallets, uh, shout out to apphex.win on this one. You can kind of see total active wallets. I ruled that out because generally speaking, that number is only ever going to go up as people accumulate. So my thought process here was daily active wallets and then averaging out that data set, roughly speaking. So that kind of gives us an average of around 14.5. Let's just conversationally call it around 5,000. Standard deviation of 5.4K. 5, 5 if we do a plus minus 1SD on this, lower bound of let's say 9,100 and some change up to an upper bound of 20,000 on this. 
So if you want a 1000x on this, then strictly by users, and I want to acknowledge not all users are created equally. Some of these folks may be individuals with multiple wallets. Some folks are, some are going to be institutions or people with fatter bags than I have and like, and will have multiple wallets. But going off the limited data we have available, then for a 1000x, again, strictly based on user count and Metcalfs is around 290,000 to 632,000. To get that 10,000x, you've got 916,000 to potentially around 2 million. And then I'm going to hear in the background, I'm sure there's somebody out there in chat or somebody out there saying is like, well, hold up, Twinkie. Like Ethereum, Solana, you're probably somewhere between 500, 600,000 estimated unique average daily users. Again, not all users are created equally. That's also without getting into things like I know uh, Richard had a few posts about uh, every time you double some of the liquidity surrounding some of these tokens and pools, that's potentially a 4x in price. Also, too, some of those assets will appreciate relative to what can potentially be deployed. My argument here for the community is, yeah, there is actually is a path to 33 cents or something even a little more wild. So for the panel's thoughts on this one, Axis, I'm going to pitch it over to you. I know you spent a lot of time looking at huge data sets uh, with your community. What are your initial thoughts on this topic? So my thoughts are pretty simple. It's just, um, let's just go with this. Richard said 10,000 X for Hex. It happened. Richard said 14,000 X potential for Pulse. So I'm just going off that number. And uh, I mean, I've seen targets of like 42 to 48 cents is is a possibility for that 14,000 X from the lows. Um, now, what do I think is a good target to aim for is probably not that high, you know, personally, like if I'm advising somebody on like how to think about the market, um, you probably want to not go for such high numbers. And I, I like your math. I like, I like that you added in there what kind of numbers of users we'd need. And I liked your comment about not all users are created equal. And in Pulse Chain and Hex, we have like some of the most super power users you can even imagine. Um, where, whereas maybe that might not be the case on Solana. You, I don't think we see a lot of DGen stuff going on on Pulse Chain currently, but I don't think that's like the. I don't think that's going to be like the norm for the whole entire duration of the bull run. It'll just come in phases. Um, because a lot of the crazy stuff that's going on with meme coins is very low amount of liquidity actually being injected into these things for these huge returns so like the big players they really kind of stay out of a lot of this stuff I except for the um what's going on with like the atropa ecosystem and uh the p maker vaults with the with the sack wallets you know I mean? like there's stuff like going on that would blow your mind and, and if this is successful this is maybe a path to getting that 30 plus cent pulse would be through making something like p die peg which is like about another 250x from here um and that if you want to pull up my screen like right now let's just do some math like to get to a dollar uh for per p die what would that mean in terms of if ratios all stayed equal uh you're looking at twenty thousand percent gain over pulse uh over to the dollar Let's see here what that would look like. 20,000% in pulse terms. 20,000%. Yeah, so I mean, you're looking at, let's just say 9,000 um, PLS per, per PDI at a dollar, right? So what does that mean for pulse price then? 20,000%. Choo, choo, choo. Wow. 20,000% in pulse price would be 20 cent. So theoretically, if the ratios all stayed the same on the dollar pair for both, and they went up together the same amount, you could maybe see 20 cents on the way to PDI to a dollar. And uh, the correlation says it's possible because PDI moves hardest when pulse isn't. So like during this period here, during the SEC crash, this is was a 63% decline for PLS, but PDI went on a massive run during that same time. So if we look at the date, it was J July 31st. Um, July 31st. Boom. 
so right before the move. So it was. It's interesting the timing of that. That that was the point where P die really started to accelerate to the upside. So can we can we can we count on P die and Atropa ecosystem to carry the weight when Pulse can't? Um, it was something that wasn't necessarily sacrificed for. Tons of it has been burned, and the amount of user supply floating around is kind of limited compared to what you'd think. Um, so P die does have the potential here to put Pulse on its back to get it up to that. 20 cent price even just if p die goes to a dollar and the ratios stay here the same at 45 pulse per unit um, but what we're seeing is actually the opposite where p die overperforms so to what degree will it overperform pulse will, will mean that pulse doesn't necessarily need to get to 20 cents because part of the movement of price to the upside here for p die is pulse being dumped into p die so then it might bring us back down slightly so you may find yourself at 10 cents or five cents or three cents but either way that that'll flip the other way too um and that when p die does do one of these where it tanked 94 percent against pulse it's basically they're supporting each other long term with with new price floors to give elevated prices on both assets so wave one wave two you know wave three something like this where these are the periods where you want to capture the most pulse. Um, and these are the periods where you kind of do want to get some exposure for the upside. Or at the very least, just rem remember that PDI is going to pull up pulse with it. And so with some of this in mind and the deep mechanics going on on pulse chain between all the LP pools and pairs and the potential uh, for some of these huge narratives to play out, um, it gets very, very interesting. Um, I guess I'll stop there. Z early thoughts on what we've just covered. You know, I think I've I've outlined there's potentially more than one path for us to get up to that. Uh, Axis has outlined some elements related to P die. I think my early takeaway from this is that it's kind of like legs on a chair in this respect, or I guess maybe a multi leg ladder up type scenario where there are multiple paths to success. What uh, what's jumping out at you when we cover some of this material? So this is actually something that got brought up in the Citadel, I think yesterday, actually, that I responded to. But somebody was talking about the pos the limitations of market cap surrounding these coins. What I mean by that is I'll, I'll read a little bit of this, which is that the person said that Hex started out as a $20 million market cap before it did a 10,000 X. Their claim was that Pulse needs $15 billion market cap just to break even. Uh, I think that math was a little proven wrong. But the point of this was that they believe that if Pulse ended up doing a 10,000 X, and then by their math, that means that Pulse would have a $150 trillion market cap. Now, let's keep in mind that right now, the entirety of the market cap of crypto is about $2.56 trillion, And at the top, it was about $2.83 trillion. So that's any indication of where we are right now in the market. But looking at specifically excluding, excluding Bitcoin and ETH, the previous top of the market cap was about $1.07 trillion. If we assume that it does a similar rate of return based on the last top to most current top, then that was about a 3.5x, which means that the market cap for everything excluding Bitcoin and Ethereum is going to be about $3.7 trillion. If we go even one layer further and we look at everything excluding the top 10, so that means we're pretty much exclusively looking at altcoins, layer twos, and all that other kind of stuff, then the previous top was $450 billion. It did a 6.6x which translates to a possible top of $3.03 .03 trillion for altcoins alone in this one. So the question you got to ask yourself is, if you believe in the limitations of market cap, then that means that theoretically you can't let your price predictions get so massive that they start to dwarf like Bitcoin and Ethereum and those price predictions. Because at that point, then you're kind of just, your, your math isn't lining up in my opinion. So particularly if you wanted to say that like, Pulse chain gets to a trillion. Currently, there's 15 uh, trillion pulse in circulation. I think there's a max of like 168 possible pulse in, ever in existence. But even going off the current estimation of 15 trillion, if you had the token reach six cents alone, that would be $900 billion. And that's taking up a pretty much like a third of all the market cap for altcoins. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm just saying that 
I've been trying to use market cap as a way to kind of curb Quit. my expectations a little bit. I Axe is about to dunk on me. I know. No, no. I just cap quick question bullshit. for you. Did, did you? <laughs> no, I agree with the thought process a hundred percent. But I, but do we factor in the OA coins or not? Because if not, then you're looking at like four to five trillion. I think user supply. I think he's maybe not even. It might only be like three. But anyway, my point is that can we just? I did not factor in OA supply. You did not. So you think so you think that Or sorry, I, I did. That includes yeah, OA supply. Okay, okay. I'm not talking about like what does the user supply look like? That's right. That's actually so another like, excellent layer. Yeah, I think we should probably I would agree with you on all points except that we need to ignore the OA supply at, at, at almost every angle that you can. So I think that puts us at let's just make an assumption. Let's make an assumption that the user supply is four trillion pulse. And then run your calculation for market cap. It would reduce it by at least sixty six percent. So then, um, a little more than that. Let's say it reduces it by seventy percent. Your market cap. So nine hundred billion. You know. What divided. was your price target? Let's just say that there's all oh, my price target. Um, yeah. So I got four trillion as circulating supply. Give me a price. We'll find one, the market cap. Let's just go to one cent. Um, and and do uh forty billion. Right. So see that see that to me that makes sense. And then if you figure that's pulse, now you have to multi let's just multiply it by four, saying all things are equal. We know that's not the case. But because and the reason why is because of P hex, PLS, PLSX, and let's say Inc. So forty billion times four, assuming they all had a forty billion market four, eight, twelve, sixteen. So hundred and sixty billion I think is a doable one hundred and sixty billion to two hundred and fifty billion market cap across RH core assets is totally within the realm of possibility and that's that's definitely you know between that one to six cent range per pulse so i, I really do think that we'll get there for sure this is this is obviously just very quick like napkin math but as, based on your assumption if we just 4x the circulating supply to kind of mimic the rest of the tokens in there yeah then that means to hit the 200 to hit 240 billion dollar market cap assuming a 16 trillion coin supply again that's it's four trillion as the user base four x just for proof of concept for yep. the different rh coins then that means that the price you get to at 240 billion is uh one and a half cents per pulse and then everything else per would pulse. be but, so that but we'd, we'd make the assumption that like inc would obviously crazy overperform to get that 40 billion market cap right versus the other one so like it depends on which one you're in but oh. uh yeah that's it's interesting um to think about those things and definitely something that I'm always thinking about. Not, I don't really actually, let me say this. I TA, I do TA, I watch charts. I don't really uh, worry so much about like what's going to be the Pico top price target. I don't, not even looking at that number or care about it. I mean, yeah, it's, I, I, t I put more weight on Richard saying 14,000 X and just figuring out roughly where that would be and then reducing it in half and then maybe even reducing it in half again, just to be, because my thoughts are like when we're preparing for the next bear market bottom, how much yield am I producing? So it's a kind of a different strategy. How how much yield am I producing at the bottom in the next bear under these conditions? Um, so you, you you could say like it could go to the fourteen thousand x and then it reduces by ninety five percent. What are my prices there across the RH assets and how much yield am I making per day? That's kind of where my head is at. I don't think. I like, I'm trying to get people to think more in terms of, can I live off the passive income I could produce at the bare bottom of the next market cycle? Um, and what, and by what decisions can I make on the way to the top to get me there faster? Hey, Axis, just for the folks at home, what are kind of the core tenets of the strategy that you're talking about here? It sounds like you're more invested in actually trying to produce passive income through yielding as opposed to trying to sell, uh, sell high by low. Um, uh, not necessarily because there may be an element there of taking profit at the, at the close to the top as possible. Oh, for sure. But like, what's your focus? Like, can sure. you give like a percentage split as to like what strategy is which? No, not really. Like, I, okay. because it's different for everybody. Oh, for sure. Some people are like, I want to take off 5 million at the top and retire and put it in my bank account. I'm just like, no, what are you doing? <laughs> You know, I, I really want people to focus on how do I stay in crypto forever and that it's just there's so much abundance inside my crypto wallets that I never have to de to take it all out. You know, yeah, you have to take it out for certain purchases of, of big items, houses, boats, cars, 
you know, trips. Like I get that, but if you can have the most exposure to crypto in a safe way, yeah, it's going to be different for everybody. Um, how you come up with how much of that is in, how much is that sold into stable coins at the top? Are those stable coins then being used to actively earn me more passive income or not? What kind of risks am I taking on in doing so? Um, do I need to have a certain amount of capital in my bank account to for for X Y Z reasons? And try to make that number as low as possible because we're trying to get out of the fiat system, um, which this is a whole other part of the conversation that we're not. You guys aren't really asking me about, but um, go in on it. So it's going to be different for each person, of course. Um, how you're going to act, like the, look at there's the ink farms are there for you to use to get rich. Like they're literally that's what they're there for, and. If you're smart about it, you can get exposure to the most price performances possible on the crypto crypto ink farms, and then you can get um, you can change your strategy um, halfway through the cycle, let's say, and then p flip all your crypto to crypto pairs in the ink farms into crypto into stable coins. Uh, that way, at like, once you get about halfway through the cycle, you're starting to DC your DCA your way out of a position and still earning that very valuable ink yield while doing so. Um, so you're kind of getting leverage. Um, you're getting paid to take profit, I guess is the way to think about that. Instead of like having to sell the very top of the market with your whole bag, think about it more of like over time, like a three month or six month time frame where you're kind of DCAing out and earning and getting paid to do it. Um, and, and never think about being all in or all out. Always have at least 50 50 in terms of 50 percent of your net worth should be in crypto in my opinion and 50 percent should be in some form of stable unit of account and that now can actually look like bitcoin and that can look like ethereum for a lot of people some people like even more stability so they'll be looking at stable coins and some of us will be looking at the speculative stable coins when they do what they're going to do this cycle um and some of us will be looking at like hex staking to hedge against um different parameters and then long term you're making five to 20 x your crypto stack in hex terms so that even if the price only goes up 10 x over a 15 year period you've still made potentially five times that 20 x or that five times that 10 x or i forget what i just said Did i say 10 or 20 x five times that in units so five times let's say 10 x you got a 50 x return because you just bought ahead and you took some profit at the top and staked hex for 10 to 15 years and earned that super high um, APY in units of crypto. Um, and, and man, there's a lot of opportunity there in, in the cheap hex right now in eHex, I think, um, to, to, to get so many units and, and play that game. So that's a, uh, and a whole other layer of, of fun. I, I think, you know, if you're, if you're new to this space, the strategy is going to be way simpler. Like, <clears throat> You can tell on Twitter who is mad and angry is because their strategy has literally just been, I'm not going to work hard and I'm just going to buy once. I'm just going to buy a few times and wait for the price to go up. That's not really the best strategy. You kind of want to be actively deploying more capital in the first third of the bull market and you want to be actively exiting during the second third. And in between there, you want to be trying to earn as much as you can on top of the plays that you're making. And it for sure can become a headache and a full-time job if you don't enjoy it. Um, so wouldn't it be cool if somebody provided a solution for people like that? I know people ask me, like, well, hey, can you manage my crypto? My crypto? Like, no, I can't manage your crypto. You, you, you'd really do yourself a lot of justice to, to, to learn this stuff for yourself and find it interesting because it's, it's amazing right now. It's very fruitful, and there's so many opportunities, and there's so many ways to play the game. And if you want more of that kind of information in depth, it's going to take more than just me sitting here spitting it for 20 minutes. You're going to have to like get involved in a community like my community on accesslive.com or somebody else's community. Um, Twitter is like the most toxic and worst spot to be. It, you're not getting any signal there anymore. Like that signal is long gone. It's been gone for a while, and now it's just at the bare bones bottom. And um, Richard Hart might tweets might give you some signal there, but. Uh, it's it's few and far between. So I guess the takeaways here is um, this this making money process in this bull market can be as complex or as simple as you want it to be. 
And there's going to be so much opportunity here that no matter what decision you make, as long as you don't sell it when you're mad and you wait till you're happy to sell it, you're going to do just fine. Beautiful. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but to summarize, it sounds like you have a very different mentality when it comes to crypto and what the overall goal is. I know a lot of people think about like trying to multiply wealth by doing the, the long distance swing trades, but it sounds like you have more of a real estate mindset, which is you're slowly grabbing and acquiring and permanently holding on to whatever you acquire. Granted, that 50% of the bag that you're talking about taking profits on, that's to help you live and to also help compound the gains in the future. But with the other 50% you were talking about, it sounds like really that's the the buy and I'm going to hold forever. This is a lifetime. This is generational. This is something that is building on an area that you think is only going to keep going up, which means that, yeah, once some of these coins go in this wallet, they are never leaving. And makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. 100%. So uh, let's say a quick tangent story was uh, talking with a gentleman last week who had sold his home and slapped the bulk of his gains from his home sales into the PulseX farms and has been using the yield from that as his interest bearing savings account. He is in the process of relocating to a far lower tax jurisdiction. And he said, good news, Twinkie, I'm out. So I said, legend. may we all be so fortunate. I hope to be right there behind your brother. So uh, along those lines, though, uh, Axis, you made some comments there about, hey, looking at some different signals, making mad gains during the first third, uh, starting your process of exiting out. I know that's one of the things I got bitten by towards the end of 2021. I was just a little too green still in the space uh, as far as recognizing a number of elements relative to market indicators and market sentiments. Uh, some weeks back, it was, uh, again, you know, a few too many drinks, just spitballing with Nate and Z on some other proxy indicators I was looking at. I said, well, you know, my thought here is Bitcoin and Ethereum, I get it. There are aspects to that where it may be, in certain respects, kind of leading market indicators. So over the last several weeks, I've been investigating some things and like, and one of the things I was contemplating was looking at the others chart here for others effectively factoring out the top 10 tokens on this stuff so let me quickly snag that one and we can take a look at that so to that end looking at this chart factoring out top 10 so we know we're pull immediately pulling out bitcoin ethereum usdt solana whatever else is potentially up there i was taking a look at this and i said okay looking at the last two cycles date of having to date of others peak condition was around 550 to 546 days so if that cycle holds true kind of using elements of that time indicator then that potentially puts us out at circa october 2025 also through a couple of quick trend lines here obviously it's up and to the right uh, early estimates in, in my brain were, again, this will all be subject to conditions and what we're talking about today may change in the future. Uh, but I'm thinking about starting a drip feed as we get a little bit closer out to either potentially rotate into some of those pulse X pools even more heavily or cashing out to bring it back to US dollar fiat or whatever domestic fiat currency based on wherever I am in the world at that point in time. Early thoughts on using this as sort of an indicator for, hey, maybe the music's starting to slow down and it might be a little more prudent to aggressively start taking something off the table. I like this chart. I like the way you have it set up. I, I like analyzing price data based on time. I think time is a huge element that goes um, overlooked a lot of times with uh, when analyzing macro market structures. And um, it for for us to, for for the others market cap to get to those levels within like let's say a top but within 540 some odd days it's gonna have to slow down so they, they, we have a lot of time left in the tank right and that's kind of exciting first off and uh, i wouldn't be surprised to see some sort of like mid-cycle shakeout uh, either in the latter half of this year or next year early on or I, i'm not exactly sure the hows and the whens and maybe in part of your own analysis, you'd think about things like the uh, election coming up or um, sell in May and walk away or um, ETH ETF as different catalysts for getting the type of price moves you're looking for so that it does take us the full 546 days to play out a cycle peak. Um, see, the first time, that's pretty mathematically 
perfect there in the first two examples. So I wouldn't be surprised for this chart to hit that earlier. And um, but I wouldn't. But I'm still been sticking pretty firm to my. This market cycle is different. This is the ETF cycle. It's going to go longer. We're going to get DeFi adoption. DCC talks about this a lot, how this is the ETF cycle, but this is also the real DeFi wave, not the um, the early DeFi wave. Um, and each each cycle, it gets better. Like 2017 was the ICO mania, which none of that stuff had value. And then DeFi happened in 2020, which some of that stuff had value. So I anticipate now you're going to start be getting things like the Amazon and blockchains launching in some form or fashion. And that may extend the cycle out even longer based on fundamental value and utility that's discovered here. Um, and so I'm eager to see, do, do we get like a early cycle peak, a rollover and a some sideways action, and then a, a final cycle peak? You get elements of that here in this chart in 2017 and 2018 and then you get it here again in 2021 going into summer of 2021 or end of the year where there's like this double bubble phenomenon um into different varying degrees and so that's kind of what i would look for is how to capitalize on those local highs and what catalysts are going to bring those kind of price movements to reality Thanks for weighing in on that. Z, Nate, anyone got anything they want to add to that? I know you guys were there when we first started spitballing this uh, very late in the morning uh, yeah. on this one. It was. Um, so traditionally, when you do look at the others chart, um, and this is the others dominance uh, chart with uh, uh, over on the daily, right? It does tend to be right around a full year after the Bitcoin halvening that the the alts do peak, right? And it's been very consistent, basically, like three out of three times. So the interesting thing then to think about as far as timeline goes is it almost seems like it's going to be right around possibly this coming fall, right, or or into the winter that uh, we will drop down, have a major drop, which if it'd be kind of interesting uh, that a Fed pivot would happen right around that time, usually takes a couple of months for the actual like crash to happen after the fed pivots but you know at uh in may you know they say oh no no we're we're gonna we're still gonna hold steady right and then they kind of just kick the can down the road until we hit maybe like around august time and also it's like okay we're gonna start pivoting now and there's gonna be one pivot in the year uh and that's what's gonna cause uh, a major crash and then as soon as that happens though traditionally after the this really big crash aka the shakeout as you said axis then from there it launches and, and all these alts, that's when true alt season happens. Because as of right now, um, just like what happened in 2020, it's kind of a warm up that takes about an entire year uh, where people don't really notice it until we're, we're at the spot that we're at now where things have finally gotten high enough uh, that people are saying, hey, it's alt season. Yay, it's alt season now. It's just starting. It's like, no, it's been going on for a while. But this isn't even true alt season. It's kind of like warm up alt season. Um, after you have that big crash, when everything just you know gets wiped out, then the true old season happens. That so that this is I, I don't know if you're going to go into it, Twinkie, uh, or, uh, any deeper into it as far as like charts go and all that. But that's kind of the prediction that I've got going on right now. And so I'm going to be looking to right around <laughs> my birthday, November of this year, and then into April of next year is going to be when I'm really going to be trying to look to DCA out. Yeah, I think uh, the different conditions will kind of dictate my moves. Uh, personally, I've got some things based on price targets, timing, market conditions, and ultimately, I think market conditions will be the final deciding factor for me personally in the grand scheme of things. But uh, I've got, let's say, my own internal weighing system. If this price target hits this, make this move and let this ride or consolidate it into some farm or what have you. If the market starts diving south and with no end in sight then i'll realistically readjust my plans and strategies on that front so uh z i think you got some other stuff you want to share and call out here i'm going to kick this one over to you brother absolutely i've got a few points but i just want to start with the exit signals for me in my opinion this is the most left side of the iq curve good solution you can come up with which is the pi cycle top indicator this is pretty much the the unga bunga do what the chart says at this point if you really wanted to 
what it does is it looks at the difference between the 111 daily moving average versus the 350 daily moving average doubled. And what this does is it tries to pick out these tops wherever possible to show you what the possible exit indicators are. So basically whenever this yellow line catches up and touches the green line, that's when you get that top indicator and it tells you, all right, it might be time to exit. Obviously this is not a 100% accurate tool because if you look here in uh, 2021, we had that double top and you hit the top cycle indicator here at the first peak when in reality, the true peak was over here at the second one. And then additionally, looking back at all the other ones, this is not your 100% solution. This is your 80% solution. This is your, your Pareto principle good enough. So I like looking on that as far as the others chart goes. So I ended up going a bit of a different direction than the rest of the guys, I think on this one, which is that I overlaid the others chart with a few different other versions of it. So what I mean is that this orange line here is the others chart excluding top 10, except this one is looking specifically at market cap, not market percentage. And then the top line is total crypto market cap. This one total three is everything three and below. So it's pretty much just excluding Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then right now I do have it on the logarithmic time scale for effectively the entirety of crypto uh, of a lot of these coins existence starting back in 2017 here. And you can see that obviously this market is highly correlated with in itself. And one of the things that even shows that is you can go and look at a correlation chart. So this is a crypto correlation chart. It pretty much shows you what the correlation between each of the different crypto assets is. And it even includes some traditional assets down here like gold and the S&P 500. So the closer that you get to one, that means that it is perfectly correlated. The closer you get to zero, it means it has no correlation. And if there ever was something that was a negative number, the closer you got to negative one means it is inversely correlated, AKA this goes up, the other one goes down. But what we see is that due to Hart's law, and liquidity bonding, everything in the crypto sphere is highly correlated. So you can look at certain ones, like we obviously have the big two, very highly correlated. And then even some of the other larger ones down here, uh, like AVAX, it gets highly correlated with some other things. XRP is a bit of an outlier because they had all their other stuff going on with legal cases and whatnot that kind of dragged them down for a while and jacked up the data. And then obviously we have a meme coin over here with Doge, but look at that, it's still highly correlated, who knew? So the point I'm trying to bring up with this is that I looked at the others chart as a way to help you indicate when altcoin season is. So the question is, what is an altcoin season? Well, effectively, that's just where altcoins are the best bet, AKA they're starting to outperform Ethereum and Bitcoin. If you are unsure of what you think is going to be going on, then your best bet is probably either Ethereum or Bitcoin. One of the, my mentor and my, my crypto rich dads, Charlie Miguel, they are definitely in the camp of Ethereum is the way to go if you're just looking for pure Xs, and I happen to agree with them. This is, again, the logarithmic chart, but I'm going to go ahead and flip it off that, actually, and we're going to start zooming into specific areas. So over here, we have the 2017 top. And you can look at this and say, like, okay, wow, Bitcoin went way much higher based on this, because pretty much the difference between the blue line and the teal line is Bitcoin and Ethereum. So looking at possibly, we'll call it from here. So here to here. That's about 500%. But additionally, if we take it from here to here, lower absolute gains, but we're looking at pretty much double the X's. And we can take it one step further. And you can see that in this season, like a lot of the, the lesser top 10 coins didn't really do a lot, but this was also 2017. There was a whole lot of that stuff going on. So in this case, the alt season did happen. Yes, but you weren't looking at the entirety of everything else, excluding the top 10. This is pretty much coins two through 10 were the ones that outperformed. Additionally, we can go over to the 2021 cycle. And again, we'll look and we'll just kind of pick, pick a date. So here we have a local low for Bitcoin. We can go up to this top here, 1500. So over here, boop, boop, boop. 18 and there we go. Now we're starting to see that all coin season in effect. So we have the big boy, the total market cap, including Bitcoin and Ethereum, only doing a 15x. Outside of that, coins 2 through 10 did an 18, or excuse me, a 19x. And then looking at the ones 10, 10 through below, they did a 30x. So this is where you start seeing those altcoin things, where it's like, if we look at a smaller time horizon, aka here to here, then that means that Bitcoin is actually outperforming all the rest of them if you zoom into that uh, micro scale. 
What I mean to say is that the others chart is a good way of looking at whose turn it is to really pump. You can kind of imagine that Bitcoin and Ethereum are that shallower line. The, the slope is shallower than the rest. And then in certain points, all the other ones start to have a much steeper and that hockey stick effect. And the, the others chart is where you really see that correlated. I was talking with Twinkie earlier and he had a very good point about this one, which is that Bitcoin is the leading indicator for this one. And everything else is kind of a lagging indicator. Bitcoin really moves the market first and foremost. So everything else is just a trailing indicator of what's previously been happening up here. And like, just imagine Bitcoin's the driver. Everything else is kind of getting pulled. So you really wait and you start to see where those altcoins start to outperform. And that's where it's their time to shine. If we zoom in on where we're sitting at right now, Bitcoin has been doing much better than all the other stuff. And comparatively, right now, it might be time for the rest of the market to really catch up. Yeah, so just for example, right here, if we got right now, Bitcoin and Ethereum went up about 3.3x. The other top 10 coins went up about 2.5x. And then a lot of the altcoins actually have been having a bit of a heyday. So arguably, excuse me, I messed up my data. Yeah, arguably, it is technically altcoin season. However, it's possible that we're, uh, we're yet to see more. What I mean by that is it's only heating up for the altcoins. Yeah, actually, I brought I brought up my little chart. I mean, it's it's an ugly chart here. Um, you have a different take on this one, I'm, and I think it's very important. Yeah, well, I, I'm not I'm not a charting guy, but I can at least look at a chart and say, hmm, it looks like there's something going on here, right? And so the thing that I noticed is that over here, right, it kind of goes up. Then we had a big shot up here and went down and then up again, right? So it's like, okay, that's interesting. But here's where things get really interesting. So like I said, uh, 344 days, 374 days. If I were to just kind of put that in the middle, 354 days, we're going to end up right around here, which is going to be about April <laughs> of 2025. Hmm, interesting. Exactly one year after uh, the Bitcoin happening, right? So the thing that I noticed, though, is this is what I was talking about. Okay, so this is the other's dominance chart, um, excluding top 10, right? And then this is what I mean when it, it's, it's warm-up season for alts because it, it just kind of slowly goes up and now then you know you hit this point where people start realizing hey it's alt season yay and then that's when we have a massive drop and this this drop happens just about every single time so when is it going to happen right that's kind of what i'm waiting on right now because it looks like we're doing the exact same thing as we did back here in 2020 and so this here is what i'm waiting for as far as like all of our little altcoins go and that's that's just something i kind of wanted to point out here um, so when I, when I talk about like, maybe it's a fed pivot, maybe we're waiting right around, like say July, August, right around this time where maybe perhaps we reach up here, then the fed pivot happens and then bam, we just drop all the way down to here and then whoop, right around, yeah, say to December, 2024, start shooting up. That's kind of the idea that I was getting there. So you can go ahead and uh, stop sharing the screen there, but you know. I'm not a charting guy, but I do notice some things. And so when you start kind of like just putting two and two together, I mean, it's just in my mind, it's a little bit of common sense, just looking at things, patterns. Yeah, I agree with you, Nate. Uh, so very interesting discussion about a number of different topics today. I think we have some good proximity indicators for when potentially on a chart level, for those of you who like to follow charts or at least eyeball this stuff. Uh, potentially some value in charts. People may not be looking at that frequently when it comes to other aspects of the market as soon as you start getting outside the uh, top 10 on that one. So to that end, I, I wanted to first and foremost uh, acknowledge our guests, Axis, Z, Nate. Appreciate having you guys on. Uh, I'm going to go around the room kind of in reverse order today. So Axis, obviously, I can find you at Axis Alive, but what is the best way to find you, track you down, and see what it is you're bringing to the table as far as the crypto community space uh, is interested in? Oh, Mike, check Axis. I think we got you on mute, bro. Let me... Yeah, I, uh, come come uh, come over and find me on, on x.com slash Axis Alive. That's where I'm going to give my um, updates on things that I'm seeing happening in the market. Um, youtube.com slash access alive doing like one or two streams a week and then on access alive.com if you're interested to know more about the the membership programs you can go over and check those out under the services tab um, we just got the access alive token listed on dex tools today so that's a huge development um, 
and uh, working on a D bank listing and some other things that way. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate you guys for having me on. Um, pretty easy. It's the same access alive anywhere. So if, if you type it into Google, you'll find me. <laughs> Thanks. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Z appreciate you coming on. Where can they find you? Absolutely. Super happy, happy to be here. Thank you. You can find me on the Twitter and Instagrams for my personal page at Zenith DI. Shoot me a DM over there if you want. And then I have the meme page that I run, which is Hexco Space Force on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I think on Twitter, it's actually Hex Space Force. So check out all the stuff I post over there. And then other than that, super happy to be here. Axis, pleasure hanging out with you. By the way, he might not have the best meme coin, but he does have one of the best community coins in existence. So check out the Axis token when you get a chance. And then other than that, you can catch myself and Nate at the DGen Roundtable. We stream pretty much Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, every week. So we are looking at a show this Sunday. Potentially, we're still figuring out if we have the team on Easter Sunday. But other than that, we got Whiskey Wednesday coming up on Wednesday. And then we got another book club covering Richard Hart's very own Sci-Vive Chapter 2 next Friday. Nate, over to you, brother. Right on. Yeah, I am the Ascending Man. And you can go ahead and find me on this link tree right here. Bam. Uh, that I cannot... <laughs> uh, uh... Yeah, Twinkie, I can't post that. Could you post that for me? <laughs> yeah, 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 no problem. I'll get you done up. Uh, certainly, too, I will have... Yeah, I will have uh, everyone's info in the show description. So if you check under the video, if you're on Replay Gang, all their info will be down there. Yeah. Yep, but uh, yes, I am the Ascending Man. You know, Nate McGetta from the D-Gen Roundtable. We are out here having fun. Uh, as of currently, there's a lot of people who feel like maybe they're falling behind or they're, they're not going to make it this bull cycle and all that. And so I have opened up consults. I've been helping out a lot of people try and get their portfolios put together because I can help you make it this bull cycle. Does it mean you're going to get absolutely filthy rich and, and retire and everything? No, but you can make it. You will you will be green in the end. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Hit up my link tree for that. And uh, yeah. Uh, just hit me up, man. Let's uh, let's we're all gonna win together, guys. Love it, Nate. Thanks for pulling the crew together today and uh, playing organizer behind the scenes. I am Mr. Angry Twinkie. You can find me on socials uh, with that tag. Hit me up on Twitter, Telegram. More than happy to have a conversation about any number of topics. So to that end, I appreciate everyone tuning in. Thanks for our guests for participating, and you can check everyone out their corresponding channels, Twitters, and the like. We appreciate it. We hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.